a couple of days ago, we launched the national standards uh, for people with uh, non-tuberculous mycobacteria in the UK. Uh, and so I thought, OK, fine, I'll, I'll, I'll lift some of the slides from that and turn them into a, a quick presentation here. Um, to give you, we've talked a bit about NTM, we focused on some of the laboratory aspects. Um, Priya, in her presentation, mentioned about some of the wild, well, the difficulties of managing NTM uh, and also um, some of the drugs that are being used. Um, but actually, it sort of is a patient somewhere in there. Um, and that was the thing that got me into NTM was that I was I was running a TB service together with people like James and so forth. And we were just getting more and more referrals of NTM, which was this weird thing, which quite literally 10 years ago at a meeting, I stood up and I said, if I get involved in NTM, you are completely within your rights to shoot me. It's quite simple. It's far too complicated for me. Anyway, here I am doing NTM. So I'm just going to hide behind some screen in case you want to have a pop at me. Um, but it's people like Shirley Harwood, and this is her, her story. Um, and as you can see, I and mean, you can read it here, but it starts in 2008. She's still with us, and that's great news. But she's had a difficult journey. Um, lots of things about delays, no one really believing, uh, and, or dare I say, an older peri or postmenopausal female doesn't complain. Nobody's that interested in their, in their illness. It's a very sexist world. You suddenly discover when you work in NTM where there are so many um, people who uh, so many women with NTM. So she uh, got onto treatment, but then things started to go wrong. And again, I won't read it out. Uh, this is these are the slides that Shirley used. I changed it slightly from I to to just describing it. But you can see that she was not being treated properly. She was being told what was going to happen and the care was not any good. Uh, and this motivated her to, and you can see that last line, she asked for a referral to a specialist because she was worried, consultant refused. And then what happened? He retired and she was delighted so she could move on. So she was having to wait for good quality care. It is astonishing. And of course, that's what happens all over the world. I think that's really important. We've already defined what NTM are. I'd, I'd drop that in just in case we didn't really cover it, but you know. But the issue is there. It's very hardy. These organisms are there. They're in the environment. So we knew the story. We knew what was happening to patients. Also, we were very interested in actually seeing what clinical care looked like. So we did a survey asking these three questions. And I'm just going to skip through this quite fast. But essentially, we were asking uh, one of the questions about where were where was cover coming from? Who was providing care? And you can see that summarized uh, on the right hand side of the screen as you're looking at it. What was also interesting was what proportion of um, people providing care actually had healthcare support um, in terms of uh, dietitians, immunologists, pharmacists, physios, and probably pharmacists and physios would be the big two other than nursing support. And it is striking because the bottom line is that one third of uh, clinical services said they had no allied healthcare support whatsoever for NTM and um, something like one in seven um, said that they had uh, no nursing support for their patients. And seeing as we know drug treatments, as Priya was saying, are not very good or haven't been to this point, this was concerning because this is a chronic illness. Very often it's not medicine that's going to make them feel better or fix them. Uh, and that drove us to um, start to look at uh, this question of what should standards of care be. And finally, the other thing, it's one thing when you've got a disease condition where um, yeah, we can't do much for you, but we can give you information. But here we had a major problem because actually, as you can see, over half of the individuals uh, said they participating centres said they had no information whatsoever for their patients. And that was a, a massive state of confusion. And it's something that we see in NTM patient care as well, which is the sister group to the NTM network. So it's a patient run organization and all the time they're saying I'm talking to clinicians who don't seem to know about this condition at all. And they're right, of course. So we wanted to produce standards of care constantly, including me. I confuse guidelines and standards of care. So what is the difference? Well, here is a definition and that's in the grey box. It's a bit dry, though, isn't it? 
But that bottom, uh, I think, bullet point is quite important. Level at which the average prudent provider in a given community would practice. In other words, it's about practice. It's taking guidelines and applying them in a way that actually you might want, if you are someone who has possibly NTM, you might want to receive that level of care. And as a, uh, a clinician providing care, you would want to achieve that level of care as well. So it's not the Ivory Towers, it's not the, the Brompton Hospitals, it's not Patworth, it's not Dundee, it's not Barts and the London. In other words, places that have got cystic fibrosis units, it's all over the country, all over the NHS. Okay. So how did we do it? Well, we embarked on a massive journey. So we had about, um, the NTM network, I should say, has about 200 centers across the UK, both clinical and research, um, about 500 members. And we put a call out saying, who would like to be involved in developing standards of care? This was 2021, 2022. And 73 people joined and 73 people put in 140,000 pounds worth of work. I know that because we've just done the, cost analysis on it because uh, I was very interested to see how much does it cost when people give their time for free and the answer is in this case around 140,000 there's quite big confidence intervals I think it's probably more than 140 but that's what we're, we're we've estimated it as and then we took the patient journey because we wanted to be as patient-centered as uh, as we possibly could and we broke it down into these units and actually originally we had nine units and we got down to six and we developed uh, quality statements uh, and standards of care within each of these and then reviewed them and worked them together because, of course, some were replicating each other. Just to explain what, what goes into it, and in fact, I'm going to make it earlier. Distribute them. So I'm going to give that to Sanji. There's nothing about microbiome. <laughs> that to you too. This is the standard. Yeah. So that is what we produced, just so you can see one I made earlier, I think. Um, but each of them has a quality statement uh, where it is something written down saying this is what we expect, and I'll give you an example of that. There's the rationale for why the group thought it was important, um, and then how it applies to the people who we think are the key stakeholders for that. So that is service providers, healthcare professionals, commissioners, and people affected by NTM. Um, in other words, what should they be expecting to take away from this? And at the same time, what should um, we be hoping that uh, how it's being interpreted and that they should get in touch with us and interpret it and so on and so forth. Yeah, Sanjeev, do feel free to send that round, that one in your hand whenever you want to. I know I'm being pushy, but I want people to have a sense of it because on the screen, it's going to be really difficult to follow. OK, um, so I'm going to give you a couple of examples of that. But the number of quality statements, you can see we ended up with 33. We actually had more, but that's 33 individual points of, of care that we felt were important enough to say we would hope. Uh, a service that's providing care for people with possible NTM will be um, uh, will be uh, doing these things. So I'm going to use two examples. First, from person-centred care, and this was uh, importantly this was led by Christabel Chen, who's a pharmacist, and that's the other really key thing. This is multidisciplinary. So this is taking people who put their hands up and say, "I'm interested in this area and I want to contribute." And it was fantastic. Physiotherapists, pharmacists, amazing input from the dietitians. Of course, we had scientists. Of course, we had we had medics. Those are the those are usually the easy ones. It's the other groups, the nurses as well. Um, and, and so, what do we have? Well, we had the rationale for why person-centered care was so important. We had the quality statements, which are here, and in this case, there were five. And let's just pick out one of those to give you an example. So it, it's not rocket science. People with NTM disease should be enabled to optimally self-manage their disease. Yes, let's think about Shirley's history. That's not what she got, was it? She was told what was going to be happening and the guy was wrong. That was the other thing. So there were all sorts of issues. So it's very strange when you, you write something that you think is self-evident and you realise that actually so much of the time we're just not doing it. So here again, the rationale. And here's the sort of things 
And the reason that I was very keen on having metrics was because I think it's increasingly important to be able to show that you're measuring something and then you can start to demonstrate change. Of course, you can change the metrics if they don't work. So they should be easy to measure. But then you can say we're starting at this point and we're trying to improve. Uh, and if we're not and if there's areas where we just can't do it, in other words, we can't measure something or we don't have the resource, then again, it tells us that there's an area of need that we can focus on. PIL stands for patient information leaflets, by the way. I realize it's not it's not spelled out there. And in fact, this is a really interesting thing because some of the uh, a number of us have been involved in things like the United Nations high level meeting. And the last one I was at, um, there were a number of TB was one of the three things that week. There was pandemic preparedness um, and there was universal health care. And what was amazing was we really saw as the TB group, we were the minnows because, you know, PP, uh, I mean, that's a big deal. Universal health coverage, really big deal. Yeah, really, really big deal. And who did they all come to? They all came to speak to us. Why? Because we had metrics because TB relies on metrics. It was such an insight to me that actually people need to sometimes just have detail. And then here's an example um, in section two. This was presented by Martin Dedicate. Uh, who's a clinician uh, based in Birmingham um, and also at the UKHSA. Um, and this was about presentation and diagnosis. And what was really important was while there were loads of quality statements, of course, because we know delayed diagnosis, and by the way, that's a piece of work that Connor uh, Tweed, based here, is leading on. Uh, Completely, un no one is prepared to fund us on, on looking at delayed diagnoses, interestingly, in NTM. Why? It's completely under people's radar. It's of no interest. It will be. As these come out, people will start to think, wait a minute, there's a huge unmet need. And we will again, eventually get funded. But it's important to be aware that sometimes the things that one tries to do, you just have to wait a bit. But this um, for this quality statement, you can see there's a rationale. NTM infections are underdiagnosed. That's true. If you don't send samples, you're not going to make a diagnosis of non-tuberculous mycobacterial infection and possibly disease. But there's no metric for this. So why is that? Well, because we felt it was too hard. We produced metrics actually for every single quality statement, and then we pulled them out of the first set of standards because what we didn't want to do was frighten people away. We wanted to create something that is a bit more soft and fluffy. That included actually the format that we went for. We used the British HIV Association style with the uh, with the standards um, because some of the others really do come across like you will do this. And um, and this is where we are now. Uh, as I said, I've taken you through this pretty quick. I just wanted to do it at the end of, uh, the end of this meeting. Um, one of the things we need to do, we really need to promote and publicize these. And so that's obviously one reason that I'm speaking to you. What I think is really lovely is that we were endorsed by every single one of these societies. So they've all looked at our standards and said, fine, we are happy to adopt these. And that's again, really important because I know you can't see who they are, but it's things like the UK Clinical Pharmacy Association, British Psychological Society, British Infection Association, Asthma and Lung UK, British Society of Thoracic Imaging, uh, as a physio group, respiratory nurses, the immunologists up there and, and so forth. So that's really terrific to get that level of endorsement. And through that, we can start to, I hope, make things happen. We're now working um, to produce, again, uh, following a, so that, uh, what the British HIV Association did, we're gonna try and produce a much more patient-friendly document, shorter, easier to, to digest, and also to be brought into clinic, to bang on a desk and say, I expect this standard care. So it's got to be heavy enough to make a bit of a noise, but at the same time, not too complicated. And then we've uh, we had an international panel uh, who were working with us. We've now given them effectively the standards. So we say to them, use them in your own, because this is the first in the world, by the way, there's, there's nothing like this elsewhere. Um, and so we're encouraging adaptation and use. Uh, what we want, we want people to say this is from the NTM network, this is through the NHS, this is this, this is that, and that's it. And then the final thing, of course, we've got absolutely no money, so we run out of funds. We've run out of funds actually for the last 18 months, um, but we definitely run out in September 2024, so it may all go down the pan. What do you reckon? Is it going to stop? 
No, of course it isn't. We did it for £140,000 for free. So, of course, we'll carry on. So there's a little bit of a plea there. If you can think of ways to continue funding things like the network and so forth, then uh, come and tell me. Thank you. That was a bit of a quick rush through NTM standards. Okay, happy to take questions.